Well, hello there, it's me again, your teacher. Um, I'm, I wanted to introduce this next part of the course by sort of taking a moment to look back and reflect upon some of the important things that have been addressed prior to, to this point. This point, we're in part three of the class, and part three focuses on how to measure more complex um, learning kind of collections of skills that are best measured through performance measures and things like portfolios. And um, I just kind of wanted to put into context what's addressed in this part of the class, again, as we look back on where we've been in the class. Uh, the first part of the class just addressed the overall concept of assessment and what it is, how it's different from evaluation, and what the three primary characteristics of any good assessment are, and that involves assessments that are reliable, valid, and fair, or free from bias. And I have to say that in the, in the, in the last exam that you just took, we had a, a good example of, of an experience that I, I think speaks to um, validity and bias a little bit, and I'll, and I'll talk about that in, in just a moment. So the first part of the course addressed overall concepts related to um, good assessments. And the second part of the course, which to me is just really, really important and valuable for educators, are, are the rules or the guidelines that you use in order to develop or evaluate the potential effectiveness of good assessment items. Like, what are the rules for designing good assessment items? And that's what part two of the class was. And that's what the last, the project that you just turned in, I asked you to apply the rules of good assessment design to a specific teaching and learning environment. And then of course we had an exam in which some specific skills related to applying the rules of good assessment design were, were measured, those skills were, were measured. And so, and, and that's actually one of the things that I wanted to talk about because I had the very first item on the exam asked you to fix a, a, a poorly written item that at, at its heart, at least from my perspective, didn't accurately measure the, um, the learning objective. And so let me just bring, bring this up again. And here we have that I, I provided a a poorly written short answer assessment that was designed to measure the skill that was in that objective, that students will apply common mathematical principles and operations, that is addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, apply them to real world situations. And then I gave you the prompt, which was uh, describe the math you would need to help you make this decision, uh, the decision of determining if you could afford a new apartment. So. I, a lot of students, as I previously mentioned, a lot of students struggled with this item. And whenever that happens as an educator, I have to really take a look at exactly why I think students are struggling. And I have to say, I made some really bad assumptions um, at first when I was reviewing um, how students responded to this item, at least those students who didn't respond the way that I, the way that I had hoped that they would. But, and, and I communicated about it really very, very poorly um, about for, for those who didn't um, respond the way I, I thought they should. I, 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 I again, I, I made, my assumption was that a poor, a poor response from my perspective was because there was some misunderstanding about what was meant by um, applying operations in real world experiences and maybe some some difficulty understanding what that even what what those what those terms or what that aspect of math meant and that was that was that was really a, a poor judgment on my part what what i was trying to communicate to everybody was that um was that whenever you write any item on, on a test you have to make some assumptions about the knowledge and skills and understanding that your students have um when they when they sort of enter into um the test 
But after I really looked at the item, I, I realized, um, first of all, it was the first item on the exam, and I provided you with a prompt that that sort of would would lead some people to certainly think that that the the prompt was designed to get at something kind of even even deeper than just creating uh, or applying like having students apply math in real world situations it was about trying to communicate sort of their understanding of mathematical principles and that's how some students in the class responded to the item so they didn't really look at it as as a a fundamental kind of math thing and more of a let's get under the hood and see if my students actually understand what the process of applying math principles are and that's how the revised items kind of looked now I anytime you have sort of a, a pattern of response that way as a as an educator you have to look at your at, at your item and say man there was obviously some interpretation or meaning based on all the factors when the when the item was presented what prompt you were supposed to edit and all of that and you have to look at all those factors and say what what how was that all of that information interpreted by the the learners and um and i think anybody who didn't respond to the item the way that i had hoped that they would which is just to create a real world scenario where they were provided with um, information that would help to budget something, apply that and to help determine whether or not you could afford something, obviously there was something else going on. And I'm really sorry about how I communicated my feedback about the item uh, because it was, it was really, uh, I made really unfair assumptions. So, um, so I'm going to go ahead and Obviously, I want to get rid of that item, and the easiest way to do that is just to award everybody just full credit, no matter how you responded to it. Because, to be honest, I'm pretty sure that if I had just not included a prompt and said, develop a, a valid assessment item based on the rules that measure that outcome, just that outcome alone, my guess is most of the students in the class would, um, have, would have done a good job of doing that. And that's because what we're measuring there is a is a performance, a, a broad kind of um, um, a collection of skills that are all applied. And that's what part three of the class is all about. So for part three, it's about how do you what's the best way to measure an overall performance? And rather than just asking sort of simple const constructed response or selected response items, how do you measure something that is um, that where there are a lot of skills being applied to something that's more um, more more procedural and some of the ways to do that are ways that are addressed in part three of the class and those are um, those are using rubrics to to help identify the the various subcomponents of what's being um, what's being measured and then also using portfolio assessments to help um, to, to provide a platform for examining overall bodies of work and artifacts that reflect the application of a lot of skills, um, hopefully within a, uh, a meaningful and a creative way. And one of the things that I do in part three is provide you with some information about all, some other reasons why you might use portfolio assessments um, in, instead of other types of assessments. And there's lots of really great reasons, I believe, that um, that you that choosing to use portfolio assessments can can be very, very valuable. So so that's what part three is all about. And I'm going to apply the principles for part three as I so evaluate and assess and evaluate what you submitted for your project to be. And that was the project where you had to develop assessment items given an overall learning learning experience that was defined and I, I hope that that learning experience I defined for you was was somewhat inspirational um, because again I, I I do believe that in addition to some of the fundamental things that we want our students to learn how to do forever as a result of our instruction I think that as educators we need to be responsive to what's happening in the real world around us 
And I think that addressing anti-racism right now is a very, very important sort of responsibility that all of us have, particularly given the current climate um, of teaching in Virginia, teaching and learning in Virginia, that we have a responsibility to help um, help students learn learn what's worth learning, and certainly what's worth learning is to be um, to be more respectful and tolerant of individual differences in um, in our in our in our world. So so that's what part three is, and it's short and quick, and you're gonna. You're, you're, going to read, you're going to finish reading these two chapters in the course text and you're going to do a very small project where you're going to create a rubric for a particular performance and, um, and hopefully the examples that I provide for that rubric development um, make it easy for you to understand um, how to do it well. And I do want to point out one more thing and that is that I did add on, on this site, on, on this page, some information about another kind of rubric development that was not addressed in the course text and that I didn't address in my course notes, but I think it's, uh, it's very useful and valuable. And so using a, the idea of a single column rubric, um, I think is, I, I really like that, um, that model. And so I'm, I'm, I'm definitely sort of encouraging it. I'm not using it in D2L because they don't allow you, the system doesn't allow you to, to create something like that, but I'm providing the resources in case that's something that you do want to um, sort of examine and perhaps even apply to this project. So, so good luck with that. And, um, and again, um, I'll be grading over the next week um, using performance assessments that um, the project that you just submitted. So. So carry on.